Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Gilbert Hosts. Today, we are going to be talking about a topic that many people want to know more about. We have many people who have joined us to hear the expertise of our guest, Dr. Victor Nitti. He is a rare breed. He's a urologist who has expertise in neurologic diseases, and he can help us understand the complexity of urinary dysfunction in people with Parkinson's. We're going to learn how Parkinson's disease can cause urinary dysfunction, the urologic symptoms that are common in Parkinson's, and potential treatments for the urologic symptoms of Parkinson's. And we're going to answer your questions. So thank you for being with us today. I would now like to introduce my guest. Dr. Victor Nitti is Professor of Urology and Obstetrics and Gynecology and Chief of Female Pelvic Medicine and Reconstructive Surgery at UCLA Health. Dr. Nitti also holds the Shlomo Raz Chair in Urology at UCLA. He completed his med medical degree at the University of Rochester and Rutgers, New Jersey Medical, completed his urology training at SUNY Downstate in Brooklyn, and then completed a fellowship in female urology, neurourology, and reconstructive urology at UCLA. Prior to returning to UCLA, Dr. Nitti was professor of urology and obstetrics and gynecology, as well as vice chairman of urology at NYU Langone Medical Center in New York. He's an authority on neurourology, urodynamic techniques, as well as medical and surgical therapies for urinary incontinence and voiding dysfunction. Dr. Nitti, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thanks, Rebecca. It is really my pleasure to be here. And it's 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 really an honor to be able to talk about lower urinary tract problems in patients with Parkinson's. It is something that I see every day in my practice. Uh, it has a huge effect on patients and also on their loved ones. So it's it's really my pleasure to be able to talk about this and bring some information to our audience about why does this happen? What can we do to treat it? Uh, et cetera. So hopefully for the next hour, we'll be able to provide lots of good information and answer lots of questions from our audience. Fantastic. We are so happy you're here with us. And Dr. Nitti, we would love if you could start us off with a brief presentation. Sure. So the first, th the first thing that I want to do is tell you all a little bit about what it is that I do. Uh, and that is so I practice what one may call functional urology. And functional urology is the function of the lower urinary tract. Rather than focus on urologic cancers, my specialty focuses more on urologic function. And that can be medical or surgical treatments for things when urologic function goes a little bit out of whack. Certainly, neurologic diseases can cause the bladder and the lower urinary tract to sort of misbehave. And we often are able to figure out why that's happening and then offer patient solutions to the problems and the symptoms that they're having. So that's my specialty within urology. And certainly conditions related to Parkinson's disease and lower urinary tract problems can often be handled by neurologists or by primary care physicians. But when that becomes difficult, it's someone like myself who often gets consulted to help sort out things and, uh, and, and offer treatment options. So the first thing I wanna do is talk a little bit about how the bladder normally works. And I think it will, it's important for our audience to understand how the bladder works so we can talk about what happens when it doesn't work quite the way we want it to. So normally during bladder filling, the bladder stays relaxed and our sphincter muscles, those are the muscles that hold urine in so it doesn't just leak out involuntarily. Normally the bladder relaxes and those sphincter muscles are contracting. They're active and they remain active throughout filling and actually through reflexes become a little bit more active as the bladder fills so that urine doesn't slip out when we don't want it to. As the bladder, as one decides voluntarily that they, uh, that they want to void or, or they want to urinate, what then happens is the sphincter muscle relaxes and then the bladder contracts 
to let the urine evacuate. And then the process starts all over again. The bladder relaxes, the sphincter contracts, the sphincter contracts more as the bladder fills until we say, okay, I am ready to empty my bladder. I'm, go, I'm gonna go to the bathroom and voluntarily empty my bladder. So what can go wrong when think, when, in this process? Well, first of all, one can experience involuntary bladder contractions. The, it's sort of a bladder spasm. And sometimes you'll hear it uh, referred to as overactive bladder. And when one has these involuntary contractions that are occurring, not when they're ready to empty their bladder at the toilet, but when they are doing something, they're out shopping or they're you know, playing golf or whatever, uh, what can happen? Well, you can, you can have a sudden strong need to urinate and find yourself urinating very frequently. You can get urgency, which can be very uncomfortable. Oh my goodness, I got to get to the bathroom right away. Or And then the, the other manifestation of that is you can have urgency incontinence or loss of urine associated with urgency. And sometimes that those bladder spasms, if they occur at nighttime, can cause one to have to get up a lot at night. You can also have what we call an underactive bladder or a weak bladder. In other words, when one goes to urinate, the bladder has lost its strength and it either can't generate a good contraction or the contraction is too short and the it's difficult to urinate, it takes a long time to urinate or the bladder doesn't fully empty. Or you can have some sort of blockage of urinary flow where there's actually an obstruction in the urethra or the tube that comes delivers the urine from the bladder to the outside world. And that blockage can be from an enlarged prostate. It can be from a bladder prolapse in a woman, or it can be from failure of the sphincter muscles to relax. And that will give you a feeling of difficulty urinating, incomplete emptying of the bladder, and sometimes even the inability to urinate. And you can imagine that these two scenarios can absolutely exist together. So you can have trouble storing urine and emptying urine, or you can have just problems with storage and just problems with emptying. Now let's talk a little bit about differences in men and in women. On the left side, you see the urinary tract of a woman, and on the right side, the urinary tract of a man. And you can see the biggest difference there is that a man has a prostate gland, and the urethra is obviously longer. So that means more things can happen and more things can happen to the prostate, which can cause issues with urinary blockage or obstruction. So things that are not necessarily caused by or related to Parkinson's disease, but can happen in patients with Parkinson's disease. And sometimes Parkinson's disease can make dealing with the issues that occur from these non-Parkinson's problems even worse. Now you'll notice on the left side, the woman's urethra is shorter. And the woman's urethra is also, and bladder for that matter, are also subject to changes that occur with pregnancy and childbearing. So vaginal prolapse can occur where the bladder or the urethra start to move a bit or a lot, and that can cause issues with emptying the bladder. And it can also cause issues with the urethral sphincter being weak so that, it, for example, some women after childbirth, and it doesn't have to occur after childbirth, but that's the most common scenario, will have issues with losing urine when they cough or sneeze or laugh. Again, something not caused by Parkinson's disease, but how we treat it might be affected by someone's Parkinson's disease. Now let's talk a little bit about Parkinson's disease in particular. Now, if you look at various studies that have been done, Parkinson's disease affects the urinary tract to some degree in somewhere between a quarter and two thirds of patients. 
So between a quarter and two thirds of patients, depending on which population we look at, will have lower urinary tract dysfunction caused by Parkinson's disease. Now we also know that Parkinson's disease affects other things. It can affect one's ability to ambulate or to move quickly. So you can imagine that if somebody has urinary urgency and it's difficult or and and when they would normally say, okay, I got to get up and get to the bathroom in the next minute or so, if one is affected by Parkinson's disease, they may not be able to make it. They may not be able to make it in a minute to the bathroom. So that means things could happen that might not happen to a patient who has the same bladder problem, but doesn't have limitations in mobility. Also, Parkinson's patients are still at risk for urinary tract problems that are totally unrelated to Parkinson's disease. So we don't want to always blame the patient's urinary symptoms on their Parkinson's disease. We need to make sure it's not the cause, but oftentimes it's not, and the treatments would be very similar to patients for patients who don't have Parkinson's disease. So the symptoms can mimic each other. Now let's talk a little bit about common symptoms that can be experienced. And you can see on the left side, I've listed symptoms that may be caused by Parkinson's. And I say may be caused because people who don't have Parkinson's disease can also have these very same symptoms. But there are reasons why Parkinson's can be a cause of these symptoms. Now, the reason that Parkinson's disease causes frequency and urgency and urinary incontinence is because Parkinson's affects certain areas of the brain. And the main function of the brain when it comes to the urinary tract is to inhibit the urinary tract. The brain sends signals that says, we don't want to urinate. We don't want our bladder to contract until we're at the toilet. Well, if that signal gets a little bit disrupted, the bladder starts to, um, in layman's terms, develop a mind of its own. And it will start contracting without your permission or without the patient's permission. So that means frequency, urgency, urgency incontinence can occur. Getting up at nighttime can occur. But getting up at nighttime is multifactorial, and I'm sure we're going to talk a lot more about that as it's a very common symptom and how we sort out problems with, uh, with urination at nighttime. You can also have from Parkinson's disease difficulty urinating, and that can occur because the sphincter muscle doesn't quite relax as quickly as we'd like it to. Think of when you get a symptom of rigidity, when, you're, when your movements are slower than you want them to be, well, the same thing can happen to the sphincter muscle and it doesn't relax when you want it to relax. And thus, urination can be difficult, it can be slower, and that can result in the bladder not emptying completely. It's rare for Parkinson's disease alone to cause somebody to be unable to urinate. Although certainly some conditions on the right side can happen in patients with Parkinson's that can cause this. So patients with Parkinson's disease, given the, the most common age of patients who are affected with Parkinson's disease, you can certainly have issues related to enlargement of the prostate. Men can have that. It can be uh, related to scarring in the urethra, what we call the urethral stricture. A woman, as we mentioned before, can have pelvic organ prolapse or stress urinary incontinence. And women can also have what we now call genitourinary symptoms of menopause. That's vaginal dryness, discomfort. Um, and that can aggravate other urinary symptoms and symptoms related to Parkinson's disease. So when I see a patient who has Parkinson's disease, I don't ever want to blame everything on Parkinson's disease. I want to make sure that these other issues don't coexist. I want to take a moment now to talk very generally 
about how we treat problems related to how we treat these lower urinary tract problems. And we'll talk more specifically about specific problems when we get to our questions. But just know that in certain cases, we can change behavior to make problems less uncomfortable or even sometimes make them go away. And behavioral changes can be as simple as changing how much fluid we drink or the timing of the day when we drink it. That's an example of behavioral therapy. There are medications that can treat urinary symptoms that work very well in patients with Parkinson's disease. Sometimes we treat conditions with minimally invasive procedures or even surgery to treat problems. And those are usually problems that are not necessarily caused by Parkinson's. So we have to consider the patient's Parkinson's disease and how it is managed in whether or not a patient is an appropriate candidate for some procedure, uh, whether it be a minimally invasive procedure or whether it be a surgical procedure. And sometimes simply improving the treatment of the Parkinson's itself can make the urinary symptoms less bothersome or worrisome. Making sure that patients have their maximum mobility, um, et cetera. So that can, can help. Again, it may not cure the problem, but it can help the patient manage the problem. And sometimes we'll take some of these more minimal or non-surgical treatments and combine them and try and avoid a surgery, for example, in a patient who doesn't want to have surgery or is not a surgical candidate. I would say most of the problems we treat related to Parkinson's are not treated with surgery. They are treated with some other forms of therapy. But again, if somebody has uh, an enlarged prostate that's preventing them from urinating or they have a pelvic organ prolapse that's a big bother, it might be that a surgical procedure is most appropriate. So we look, it's very important. It's important for any patient, but particularly for patients who have issues like Parkinson's disease, is to individualize the therapy, to make sure that we are offering treatments that get to the core of what are bothering patients and also um, are within the range of the expectations of the treatment, both good and possibly bad, are within the range of what the patient is willing to accept. So it's always an individualized treatment. And, and I, I can't say how important that is for patients with diseases or conditions like Parkinson's disease. So that, that concludes kind of my formal presentation. And I think we can move on and I am happy to answer any questions that people have uh, regarding this, this, these, uh, these issues and this topic. Thank you so much, Dr. Nitti. That was uh, excellent, an excellent review. Thank you for all that great information. And we certainly have many questions already. We have uh, over, close to 200 questions that came in during registration. So we certainly won't be able to answer everyone's question, but we're gonna do our best um, to answer as many as we can. And we're eager to answer the questions of our audience that is watching live. So please, right now, submit your question using the live chat feature in YouTube and Facebook, and be aware that we may you uh, show your question using the name and or photo you're logged in with. And so let's get started. Now, Dr. Nitti, you talked about uh, urinating at night and how that's a massive problem for many people. Our very first question from Mary, um, I think will encapsulate many people's questions. And that is, my husband has to use the bathroom five to seven times at night, disrupts both of our sleeps. How can we address this? Okay, so this is, I'm glad it's the first pick, the first question, Mary, because this is, probably the getting up at nighttime is the most complex question to answer. And the reason for that is there are a number of reasons why someone gets up a lot at night. Reason number one is they may be producing a lot of urine during the evening. What happens to us naturally as we get older 
is there is a tendency for our bodies to produce a larger proportion of urine when we lie down and relax and go to sleep than in the daytime. So that's one potential problem. And there are some medical conditions that can make that worse. There are some medications that can make that worse. The second problem is it may just be that the bladder is relatively small. So it's a 24 seven problem, but it really bothers the patient, or in this case, your husband and you, mostly at nighttime. So it's a small bladder, but it's particularly bothersome when you're trying to sleep. And the third thing that can happen, particularly in a man, although women are not immune to this, is that the bladder may not empty itself completely. So let's say there's prostatic enlargement and that causes a patient to retain urine and they're not completely emptying their bladder. So the glass is always sort of half full. It never gets empty and it doesn't take in an hour or two, that glass becomes full again and, it, and it's time to empty. So those are the three reasons why things can happen. Sometimes it's a combination of both. So what I, when I see, if, if I were to see your husband, there's some very simple things that I would do. The first thing I would do is obviously see what's going on in the daytime with him. And then I would see how well is he emptying his bladder. And we can assess that by simply doing an ultrasound of the bladder, a bladder scan, which most urologists have in their office to see how empty the bladder is after he urinates. And then what I would do is ask him, to keep a diary. It's a little bit cumbersome, but boy, is it helpful. And it doesn't hurt and it doesn't cost a penny. And basically what I would have your husband do is say, all right, pick any three days that work for you. And I want you to write down how much you drink and when, and how much you urinate and when, and let me know when you went to bed and woke up so I can see what was in the middle of the night and what was during waking hours. And then with all that information, we can say, all right, is this a problem with we need to reduce urine output at nighttime, or do we need to get him to empty his bladder better? Or does he just have an overactive bladder and we need to expand the capacity of his bladder? And that sometimes is done with medication, for example. So you, with getting up at nighttime, that particular symptom, you really have to get to the to the core of what's causing the problem, because there are so many things that can cause the problem. Same in a woman, exactly the same workup, but the workup is simple. And usually with that simple information, we can start treating, whether it's with medications, changing behavior, getting him to produce less urine at nighttime or treating his prostate. Extremely helpful. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we have many people who've asked questions, both in registration and now in the live chat, about Kegel exercises. Can you explain what they are and when, if you suggest them to people, and when would be the scenario to use that kind of therapy, that kind of behavior change therapy? Okay, so that is another behavioral, uh, what we would call a behavioral modification. So a Kegel exercise is when we contract our pelvic floor um, on a regular basis, contract and relax the pelvic floor. Now, the best way I can explain how to, how to do that would be, imagine yourself urinating and you, you're going to contract the muscles that will stop you from urinating. Those are the muscles you contract when you do a Kegel exercise, but I am not recommending that you do it during urination. That just tells you what those muscles are. The best way to Kegel exercises work in two instances. First is that it can help, um, it can help urgency to go away. Now imagine that you are walking around and you get a sudden strong urge to urinate. What most people will do, whether they know it or not, is they'll do a Kegel exercise. They'll contract their pelvic floor and they'll hope that that urge goes away until they can get to the bathroom. Well, with Kegel exercises, you do that same thing, but you do it not necessarily when you get an urge. And by doing that regularly, the pelvic floor teaches the bladder to calm down. So it can help to 
prevent those bladder spasms from ever, ever coming on. Another thing Kegel exercises can do is it can help with the condition of stress incontinence. So if you're a woman who's had children and loses urine when she coughs or sneezes, or a man who's had prostate surgery and loses urine when he coughs and sneezes, those same exercises can help to strengthen the muscles of the pelvic floor to prevent that kind of leakage. So Kegel exercises are very useful. If you can't do them on your own, you can learn how to do them with a physical therapist. I send patients to physical therapy all the time to learn that. You have to be patient because you're not going to see results tomorrow. You're going to see results in weeks to months after starting to do those exercises, but they can absolutely be helpful. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We have a question from Teresa. And it's not just her question. We have a few people that ask similar things. Is why on certain days of the week, I might, sit, I might soak through several pads and have a lot of incontinence and then followed by several weeks of no problems at all. Is there something I can do to capture when the problem happens and when it doesn't to help? Teresa, that is the $64,000 question, maybe the $64 million question. I think if I knew the absolute answer to that, um, I wouldn't have to work anymore. <laughs> but but think of it this way. When, I, when patients tell me that, uh, and, and sometimes the situation is within your control, and sometimes it's just not within your control. You don't know, or I don't know why you're having a bad day. But if you do have a bad day, try and associate anything that you did on that day with what might have happened. Did you drink an excessive amount of fluids on that day or the day before? If you're having a good day, was it a day that you may have been relatively dehydrated because it was hot out? Um, is there any medication you took on your good day or your bad day that is a little bit different? Sometimes it's not necessarily what you drink, but it's the food you eat. Did you eat, did you happen to eat foods that were higher in 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 water? Oh, did you eat a lot of fruit and vegetables, etc.? So so that's the easy thing. But sometimes in, in patients with or without neurologic conditions, you just don't know why it happened to be a good day or a bad day. The other thing that's really important when it comes to the urinary tract is, is your gastrointestinal tract and bowel movements. If you are having issues, particularly with constipation, that can very much mess up your urinary tract. So if you're going through a period of constipation, you may be going through issues with either difficulty urinating or having more issues with incontinence. So you know, the, the best thing that you can do is try and identify factors, but understand that sometimes no matter what you do or what I or your physician does, we just can't figure out why one day's a better day than another. Okay, fantastic. I'm glad you mentioned that, that piece about the connection between the bladder and the bowel, because many, many people are asking that as well. Um, so maybe we can address that. If there's anything you want to add about um, whether, uh, you know, how the bladder and the bowel functions are interacting and is it important to treat one in order to uh, maximize the function of the other? The answer to that is absolutely yes. And uh, it, it's probably my bad for not putting that as treatments in my little introductory slide, because if you're if you are having significant bowel issues it's likely that there are also going to be some urinary issues particularly in patients with conditions like parkinson's disease in particular in patients who get who who are getting older there are the the bowel and the bladder have the same nerve supply so the nerve supply to the bottom part of the colon and the nerve supply to the bladder is exactly the same. So when if your bowel is distended because you're constipated, it's going to affect or it could affect the innervation of the bladder. 
So treat, you know, if somebody has major issues with constipation and they're also having urinary issues, it's if if one can get that constipation under control, uh, it can very sometimes it completely alleviates the urinary symptoms and sometimes it makes the urinary symptoms easier to deal with. Great. Um, so lots of people are asking about that. So thank you for that. Uh, we have a lot of questions where people are curious about the uh, minimally invasive procedures you mentioned. Somebody mentioned specifically the urine lift um, as, as something that has been offered to him. Um, and and a, a few people are, are talking about stimulators that have been offered. Um, would you be able to give a summary about some of these procedures and when you would suggest them for different um, uh, symptoms? Sure. So I'll talk about a, a few of them. Let's start with the bladder first. So what minimally invasive procedures can we do to calm the bladder down? Then we'll talk about some of the prostate procedures. So once we get past medicines, a uh, patient takes a medicine to calm the bladder down and either they have a side effect or it just doesn't work. And we know that the patient's having a lot of spasms or involuntary contractions. How can that be addressed? So there are two ways that we can do that. The first way is with botulinum toxin or Botox. Botox can be directly injected into the bladder to calm it down. It is a very effective treatment for bladder spasms and urgency and continence related to those bladder spasms. Botox, however, has a caveat. And the caveat is that in a small number of patients, it can make urination more difficult. And it could even make it such that you empty your bladder so poorly that it requires that you facilitate emptying with a catheter. So that happens around 5 or 6% of times. In patients with Parkinson's, we need to be particularly careful because if it's a man who has an enlarged prostate and you use Botox and that prostate is causing some blockage, it could really make it such that he can't empty his bladder. Uh, that's less of a problem in women. But it, so Botox is highly effective in the properly chosen patient. The stimulator that one of our listeners was referring to is you can stimulate the nerve that supplies the bladder and it can be stimulated either higher up near where the nerve comes out of the spinal cord, where basically an implanted electrode is placed there and it's connected to a pacemaker, or the nerve can be stimulated further down near the ankle. And that can either be done with an acupuncture needle or it can be done now with an implant in the ankle stimulating the nerve. And basically what that stimulation does is it sends a message back to the, uh, back to the bladder to calm down. Now, one issue with that, with those therapies in patients with Parkinson's disease is that they have not been extensively tested in Parkinson's patients. If you ask me, do I think it works in patients with Parkinson's? I would tell you absolutely it does, but it's not been tested. So if one opts for those treatments, you have to be sure that insurance is going to reimburse for that treatment because they may look at it and say, well, it's not, it's not been tested in, and, and it's not just Parkinson's, it's any neurological condition. But I have used it in patients with Parkinson's and used it successfully. Minimally invasive treatments for the prostate are things that try and open up or reduce blockage in the prostate without doing a surgical procedure to remove a portion of the prostate. Urolift is one of those procedures. And what a Urolift does is it simply, it's kind of like a a suture with two metal tacks on the end of it, and you place it into the prostate to kind of push it open. And you'll take four or six of these or, or whatever numbers necessary to push the prostate open. The idea is it pushes it open, it makes it easier to urinate. 
Um, it does not work as well as traditional surgeries, but it is less, it's a little bit less, and for sure it's less anesthesia. Um, I think when one chooses a minimally invasive treatment for an enlarged prostate, you should know all the pros and cons of each of those treatments. And also, if you have Parkinson's, make sure that the symptoms that are being treated are going to be treated by treating the prostate. And it's not, well, you just have a very overactive bladder because of your Parkinson's. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Lots of great information. Uh, we have a bunch of questions about the interaction between treating Parkinson's disease and urinary symptoms. And so we have a question from uh, Michael here. My wife is not on L-DOPA at this time, so presumably not being uh, treated with a Parkinson medication, but does have urinary frequency. Would going on medication for Parkinson's help the urinary problem? And I'll give you a great big maybe on that. Um, and, and it very well could because when, when we treat Parkinson's, we're treating the problem centrally in the brain. And if that is um, what happens to be causing the urinary symptoms, then it, it may help the urinary symptoms. Now, the other thing you can say is, well, if her Parkinson's symptoms don't require that or it's been for whatever reason she's not using those medications um, you could treat the urinary symptoms with a medication that focuses on the bladder that doesn't affect parkinson's disease so the way i would think of that and i am not a neurologist but the way i would think of that is if the parkinson's medications are going to be helpful or are th would th be thought to be helpful for other symptoms of Parkinson's, try that and see what happens to the urinary symptoms. But if the idea would be, we don't want or need those medications at this time, then I would say, don't treat the urinary symptoms with a primary Parkinson's medication if that's not needed for other symptoms. Great. Uh, so now that we're on the topic of medication, we've had many of our listeners and also in registration ask us, uh, what medications do you use in people with Parkinson's disease who have urinary dysfunction? Okay. So my choice medication, so there, there are two classes of overactive bladder medications. The first class are called anticholinergic medications. And anticholinergic medications have been used for probably 50 years um, to treat overactive bladder, bladder spasms, et cetera. Um, and they are effective in treating the problem. The problem with anticholinergic medications are they have side effects, the most common being uh, dry mouth and constipation. And they have also been associated with issues with cognitive dysfunction and dementia. Now, I say associated with because there's not a definite cause and effect, but that's just because that, that hasn't been yet studied. But we know that patients who take anticholinergic medications, whether they're for the bladder or for other things, uh, they do have a higher incidence of dementia, and, that, and we know those medications can cause issues with brain function. So I try to stay away from those. The newer class of medications are called beta-3 agonists, and there are two of those. And those medications do not have, that we know of, do not work centrally in the brain. Um, and their effects are limited for the most part to the urinary tract. So there's much, much less side effects. So I can give you the names of all of them if you want, but the, the names of the, uh, the medications that I prefer would be Mirabegron or Mirbetric and Vibegron or Gemtessa. Those are the two newer ones. The anticholinergic medications, which are now, I think almost all of them, except for maybe one or generic, would be oxybutynin, 
Trospium, if I had to use an anticholinergic, I like trospium because it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier, at least not in healthy people. So it's less likely to give issues with the brains, less brain, less likely to have an effect on Parkinson's. Um, Solafenacin uh, is another one. Um, Darafenacin um, uh, and phasoteridine and tolteridine. So those are the older medications that I prefer to stay away from, but sometimes I still use them in select patients carefully, but you still can get a lot of benefit from them, but you just have to be careful managing potential side effects. And as we said, if a patient gets bad constipation, then any effects you get to treat the urinary tract may be negated. And occasionally I will use the two medications together. Uh, if I have a patient who has a real problem with their bladder, I'll start with the, the, the beta-3 agonist, the one that I like, and maybe add a low dose of an anticholinergic to minimize side effects. Thank you for that. Uh, great question from Jerry, like your comments on this. Are intravaginal radiofrequency treatments useful for urge incontinence as well as vaginal dryness? And what is your experience with, the, with that treatment? So, um, radio frequency treatments have been um, advocated to treat stress incontinence. Um, I don't, I, I wouldn't say that they don't work as well as, in my opinion, other treatments that are available for stress incontinence. Um, there are various forms of energy that can be used to treat vaginal dryness. The most common forms of energy that are used to do that are in the form of various types of lasers, fractionated carbon dioxide lasers, and they can be quite effective in treating vaginal dryness and genitourinary symptoms of menopause. I don't think we have enough of real good data to know how well those things work on urinary frequency and urgency. I would say anecdotally, I, I would say sometimes it makes things better, just like vaginal estrogen, which is a much simpler, easier, and less expensive way to treat, treat vaginal dryness, uh, just as vaginal estrogen can sometimes benefit urinary symptoms. But it's not, it's in, in my mind, it's not the primary reason why those treatments should be used. And most of the time, that's an out-of-pocket expense for patients. Those treatments are generally, to the best of my knowledge, none of them are covered by any insurance. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we have a question from Steve, and this is actually a question that many people have asked in, in various forms and we haven't addressed yet, and that is the issue of catheterization. So Steve um, asks about what is the potential success of using an external catheter um, or a sheath to a need for urinary um, urge? And um, other people have asked about catheterization. And is that something you advocate? Is that something that um, can be helpful to, uh, to get the urine out if you're not fully emptying your bladder? So there is no question that catheterizing can help get the urine out. My question is always, why isn't the urine coming out? And if the reason is you've developed a very weak bladder over time, that's something we don't have a good treatment for. So if someone has a weak bladder and they don't empty it well, um, a trial of catheterization to help empty is certainly a reasonable thing to do. And the patient would just have a catheter and put it in and out. A condom catheter, that's just a management technique. So a condom catheter is just an alternative to a pad or a diaper. You're not really treating the problem, but it's just an easy way of collecting the urine. Um, in a way that might be more pleasant for a particular patient than perhaps wearing a, wearing a pad or a diaper. So the two are different, a condom catheter or a sheath, as, as was mentioned, that doesn't facilitate bladder emptying. It just gives you the opportunity to, if, if you have an accident, 
it's a way to collect it. Or if you say, gosh, I can't get to the bathroom, I'm just going to urinate and you have this condom on and it goes into a bag. Sure, it's a management technique. But cat, using a regular catheter that's inserted into the bladder and empty the bladder can be an important way to manage urinary symptoms in patients who cannot empty their bladder completely. And for me, it's always also trying to determine, uh, is there anything else I can do to get the bladder to empty better? If, you, if it's the patient just has an enlarged prostate, well, if a patient with an enlarged prostate can't urinate, just because that patient has Parkinson's disease doesn't mean I can't do something for his prostate to allow him to urinate normally. Very good. Um, so another issue that we haven't um, talked about enough yet, and we're nearing the end of our hour, is uh, the issue of man of behavioral management of fluid intake, which you mentioned uh, briefly in your presentation. We have a question that came in during registration. I'm a water drinker. What is the best approach to getting hydrated? If I also have urinary frequency and sometimes some nighttime incontinence, how do you balance the two? Okay. Well, I think the the, first, the most important thing is, you know, what is adequate hydration? And I think some people overhydrate themselves. Uh, some people certainly underhydrate themselves. But I know that the recommendation of drinking eight glasses of water a day is not achievable in most patients um, over the age of I don't, 50 or 60, to be honest with you, uh, just because that's a lot of water and that's a lot of potentially a lot of urination if you have underlying urinary symptoms. Now, some people need to remain, be hydrated because they have other medical conditions that require them to, you know, they have low blood pressure, they, uh, they get constipated if they don't drink a lot. So assuming you're drinking the amount of water that you need to drink and you're not overhydrating yourself, uh, then I think try to drink, you know, if you notice a time of day when it's particularly inconvenient, for you to be urinating a lot, and that could be at nighttime when you're sleeping, try and limit your fluid intake to the daytime hours and minimize fluid intake, let's say after dinner. That can help with nighttime issues. Um, try and hydrate yourself as best as possible at times of the day when producing more urine is less likely to become a problem for you. Um, but also just make sure that you're not overdoing it. When I have patients do diaries, sometimes, you know, I'll have a patient come in and they're drinking four to five liters of water a day. Most people do not need to drink that much. If you want to drink that much, it's okay. But the consequence will be you're urinating too much. So I'm not recommending dehydrating oneself, but just make sure that you're not overhydrating as well. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Margaret asks a great question. Again, a topic we have not talked about, but it's very important to, uh, to explain in our broadcast, and that is urinary tract infections. People with Parkinson's, do they get frequent urinary tract infections? Um, if so, why and how can we prevent them? Okay. So this is, we could do an hour on this topic <laughs> yes. just alone. So the first thing that I, I want to say, yeah, yes, patients with Parkinson's can get urinary tract infections, women more so than men. But the most important thing about quote unquote urinary tract infections is what symptoms are associated with it. Sometimes I'll ask a patient, well, have you, had, you ever had a urinary tract infection? And they say, oh, yes, I had one last month. And I'll say, well, what symptoms did you have? Oh, I didn't have any. I went to my doctor and they did a urine sample and they told me I had an infection. We have in urology and hopefully in medicine in general, gotten away from treating patients who have bacteria in their urine without symptoms. Sometimes bacteria in the urine can actually be a good thing because if you don't have any symptoms, it can mean that you have a friendly bacteria that's not causing a problem. So First thing I want to say is when we talk about urinary tract infections, we're talking about real infections, patients getting symptoms of frequency, urgency, burning, 
loss of urinary control, blood in the urine, those kinds of things where there's definitely symptoms. So if one is getting recurrent urinary tract infections, there are a number of reasons why. In a woman and a postmenopausal woman, the most common reason is the change in the bacteria that's in the vagina. Uh, when estrogen goes away, the kind of bacteria that are in the vagina go away. There's more bacteria in the vagina that can cause problems and it becomes easier to get infections. So for a postmenopausal woman, estrogen replacement with topical, not systemic, but topical, topical local estrogen is extremely effective in helping to prevent urinary tract infections. Now, sometimes there are urologic things that cause recurrent infections. In uh, The bladder's not emptying itself completely. Somebody has a stone in their urinary tract, or there's other pathology within the urinary tract that needs to be treated. And that has absolutely nothing to do with one's Parkinson's disease. It's just something that has developed. That's actually very uncommon. Other, There are other simple things that, that have been shown to be effective in preventing urinary tract infections in people who get a lot of urinary tract infections. Cranberry supplements have been shown to be effective in reducing urinary tract infections. They, they help to prevent bacteria from sticking to the wall of the bladder. D-mannose can be effective in that. That's an over-the-counter product, but you have to be careful because D-mannose can raise uh, your, the, the glucose level in your blood. Um, I prefer cranberry to D-mannose, but I have plenty of patients who take D-mannose. And sometimes we'll, we'll use medications to prevent urinary tract infections, but that's less common. Okay, we have time for one last question. We are unbelievably at the end of our hour. Um, and uh, we want to thank you, everyone listening. We want to thank Dr. Nitty for all that unbelievably amazing information. Um, so our last question is, um, I don't have any urge to go to the bathroom anymore. So it's kind of the opposite of some of, uh, of the people that have been uh, submitting questions. What can help me um, to get that urge back? So that depends why you don't have the urge and what the consequence of not having that urge is. So one of the reasons for that is a person can have, and I'm not saying you have this, but a person can have an over distended bladder that just isn't emptying and it's lost its sensation and it's lost its tone uh, and it's lost its ability to contract. And if that were the case, the best thing to do is to start emptying the bladder on a regular basis. And that would probably need to be with a catheter. Now, there are some people that lose the urge to urinate, but still can go into the bathroom and do what we call timed voiding. Go, yeah, I don't really have to go, but it's been four hours. I'll go in the bathroom. And they can effectively empty out their bladder. In those cases, I would say, and if the bladder is completely empty, you may never get the urge back, but as long as you're able to empty your bladder, hopefully the lack of urge will not cause any other problems. So I think that, you know, the reason or the wanting to get that urge back really depends upon, is there anything else going on or is it just, is it just that your bladder has become less sensitive over time but I don't know anything to do to make it more sensitive that would be safe. Very good. Thank you so much. Again, we've covered a vast array of topics within our urinary dysfunction uh, world of Parkinson's disease. Thank you so much, Dr. Nitti. Uh, I, I really think we've uh, um, touched on uh, many of the concerns of our listening audience and, and given some amazing information. So thank you so much. And again, thanks everyone for participating, for submitting your questions and for um, our, our lively discussion today um, on YouTube and Facebook. And if you know someone who missed today's program, if you joined late, you'd want to watch again, this recording will be available later today in our YouTube channel. And don't forget when you're there to subscribe to APDA's YouTube channel to watch new videos and live broadcasts. 
For additional information and resources, please visit our website at apdaparkinson.org. Now our next Dr. Gilbert host will take place on September 20th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we're gonna be talking about another uh, very popular topic, which is nutrition and Parkinson's disease. We're gonna be talking with registered dietitian, Jessica Schroeder. So please register today and join us for that broadcast. Now be sure to stick around for a few final messages. Before we go, I wanna thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you soon on another APDA program. Have a great rest of the afternoon. I'm Leslie Chambers, the President and CEO of the American Parkinson Disease Association. Each month across the country, APDA is providing support groups, exercise classes, and educational programs like this one to support the Parkinson's disease community. You can find all of our upcoming virtual events on our website at apdaparkinson.org slash events. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, I hope you will consider making a donation to help keep programs like this possible. Your gift can help APDA support people living with PD through local programs, reliable resources, and groundbreaking research designed to find treatments and ultimately the cure for Parkinson's disease. Please donate today at apdaparkinson.org slash donate. And thank you so much for your support.